we put all these together and we have a great series of hypotheses. What's interesting is the word hypotheses, I call that a $50 word. That really sounds pretty important. And I use it when I teach this class in universities. But you know what? The word hypotheses is really a fancy word for guesses. And if you really think about it, when you fill out the business model canvas, all you have is a series of guesses. That's it. That's all we have is a series of guesses. What's great about the business model canvas is it allowed us to organize our thinking not around functional organizations or like what's sales doing or what's marketing doing or what's our spreadsheets say, but it's around a, a series of thoughtful first guesses about who do we think our customers are and, and what products are we making for them and how much are we going to charge. And that's great. And you could sit around all day or all week in your conference room figuring out what those are. But the odds are you're probably wrong. But it's a great first starting point. But the question is, how do we change those guesses into facts? So one of the really interesting developments about this class is this whole customer development process. It says you start with your business model canvas hypotheses. And in fact, what you really do is you uh, blow up the canvas and you actually post it to the wall. And you use yellow stickies. No pens or pencils allowed because you are going to get most of them wrong but you're going to make it visible and you will actually begin to construct your hypotheses. And the next thing you'll do is look at them and go, hey, there aren't any facts in this room. Let's get out into the building and talk to customers and partners and vendors and we'll learn how to do this with some rigor, with a process, not just randomly getting out, but actually design experiments, run tests, get data, and more importantly, get some insight. And the customer development process is kind of interesting. The customer development process is actually a four-step process. The first step is customer discovery. This is where you construct your hypotheses and you get out of the building and start testing your assumption about whether other people have the same problem or need you think they have. And then you're going to do customer validation and actually see if your proposed solution actually matches what you think the customer problem was. And this test of between problem and solution and your features and customers is actually sometimes called product market fit. That's what you're out testing. And this is what we call the search for the business model. But now instead of randomly doing this by hiring and firing sales execs and trying to make numbers that really are just random guesses, we're actually going to have you get out as early as possible and test some of these primary assumptions. One of the interesting things on the bottom of this diagram that we'll talk about is something called the pivot. And the pivot is what will save your job. Once you find this repeatable and scalable business model, then you go into the execution phase of customer development. And that's about creating end user demand and scale called customer creation and then building the organizations to actually build your company for scale by transitioning from customer development into a functional organization that's oriented for constant uh, and rapid execution. So what are the four phases of using customer development when building a company? And so the phases of customer discovery start with stating your hypotheses, testing the problem, testing the solution, or verifying or pivoting. Now one of the interesting things about customer development that makes startups very different from large companies is that customer development is done by the founders. Well, why the founders? Uh, it, it turns out that there's a couple of interesting things and this is about human nature. There's no technology involved. In a traditional startup in the old days you would hire a VP of sales who would go out because you were smart, this was your idea, and you'd say, go, go try to sell this, go talk to customers. I'll just hire somebody to do this. But remember, a hire, so an employee, doesn't have the vision. They're just executing what you told them. And guess what happens if they go out and talk to people who say, this is the worst idea we ever heard, or no, we won't buy it. What happens is they'll come back and tell you, and the first time they do this, so you'll say, well, you're just not describing it right. And you send them back out for another couple of days or weeks or months, and they'll come back again. And if you're like any passionate founder, you'll go, I hired the wrong executive, you're fired. Now just imagine we run the exercise, this time not with a proxy, a head of sales or marketing, but we force you to get out, you the founder, to start talking to customers. And if you got that same exact feedback 
it might take you three customers or five or 30, but eventually smoke will start coming out of your ears because cognitive dissonance is, is now coming into effect, is that you might realize that your story or vision isn't right. But unlike a proxy, a VP of sales or marketing, you have the power to change the company's strategy. You have the power to change the entire value proposition to say, well, what if we had these features? And customers might say, nah, 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 still not. But then if you said, well, what if we had this? They might say, oh, if you could do that, you could have my check right now. Now, if you're a smart founder, you'd say, I'll be, let me get right back to you. Because what you'll do is you'll go test that new feature with five or ten other customers. And all of a sudden, you realize that you had the wrong feature set. And just by adding the small little change, you could now actually get a whole series of paying customers. Only founders could do that. And what we did in the past is we would wait to first customership, we'd wait till sales didn't match the revenue plan, and we'd actually make these changes by firing executives instead of actually having the founders engage in day one. So it's the founder who could change the product, make pivots, and hear customer feedback firsthand. And that's the idea of getting the founder outside the building. The next piece about customer development to understand is what is it you're actually doing out, outside the building? And what I think about is you're really testing on the highest possible level your understanding of the customer's problem or need. You implicitly had a hypothesis I want to extract from implicit to have you make explicit. Here's what the pain and the gain we're actually doing for these hypothetical customer segments that I've written down in my canvas. Great. So how are we going to go do that? So literally we're going to get out of the building, take our hypotheses, and we're not just getting out of the building and randomly talking to customers, because if that was the case, we could have just sent them a letter or sent them email. What we're looking for is not just data, is insights. And how this process will work is we'll get out of the building, and then as we find those new insights, we'll actually change the canvas. Big idea. We'll change the canvas by marking it up and saying, you know, we thought the customers were these kinds of people. Holy cow, they are actually these kinds of people. And we thought the features we need, well, they're kind of different. They're actually these features. So what you're doing outside the building is you start with these hypotheses. In this case, let's just take an example. The customers will be male, 24 to 35, live in urban areas. And then we're going to design some experiments. Let's go figure out maybe a Google AdWords campaign. Or if it was a physical product, go out and meet them personally. And then run some tests and take a look and analyze the data. But it's not just the data. We're trying to understand, did the results match the hypotheses? And if not, just don't give up and say, well, it didn't. Let's try another segment. Understand why your initial hypotheses were wrong, because it's this why not that might give you some insight. So what you might find out in this case is, oops, we kept getting teen girls in suburbia. And you could either keep deciding, no, 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 I want men, or you might go, well, wait a minute, the teen girls are actually enthusiastic, in fact, paying money, trying to figure out how to buy our product right now. The other interesting thing about the customer development process ties back into agile engineering and agile development hand in glove. Basically, it's this notion of the minimum viable product. Back in the old days, what we used to do is specify the entire feature set of the product from beginning to end. Now, this makes sense when you're in a large company releasing version 2.0, 3.0, and 4.0, because you kind of have a feeling of who the customers are and what they need. So a product manager can be pretty accurate about, you know, I've been interacting customers for the last year and a half, and I think I know what they need. But in a startup, you're really kind of guessing. And the odds are you're going to be guessing wrong. So rather than waste a whole ton of time and money, why don't we actually get outside the building before we build something and waste a lot of engineering time and more importantly cash because that's what puts startups out of business is running out of money. We want to make sure that we actually listen to the people who eventually will buy this product. We want to make sure we satisfy their wants and needs. Uh, so why don't we just figure out how to build the minimum viable product. Build the minimum features in order to get feedback. Now, feedback could take the form of input and, and verbally, or they gave you early orders, or they gave you anything that was valuable in helping you come to closure of what should we be building in what order. And by the way, an MVP could be something as simple on the web as a wireframe or a PowerPoint slide, or for a physical product, it could be a physical mock-up, or it could be a working part of the system. 
But as you get more feedback, you could start adding more features. So one caveat is a comment I always get is, well, Steve Jobs didn't build the iPhone by asking customers, and we really doubt Henry Ford asked customers, did they want a car before one existed? In fact, in his case, if you would have asked people about what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse or one with six legs. And so the immediate response is, well, therefore, for new products, you just don't get out of the building at all, and that's just a fallacy. There is a type of startup in what we call a new market, and we'll be describing new markets in the customer segments lecture. But just understand that in new markets, of course you don't get out and ask people what features they need, but you do want to understand how is their day in the life different today versus the day after you give them your new product? How does their world change? And there's no possible way, sitting locked in your conference room or your office, you would know that without talking to customers. One of the other interesting observations about customer development is this notion of the pivot. Pivot was a term that my best student ever, Eric Reese, coined when he noticed the arrow between customer invalidation and customer discovery, and he actually gave it a name, which I think is uh, in incredibly accurate. A pivot says, what do you do when your hypotheses don't meet reality. And this is such a neat observation about startups and why what we now know is much different than before. What we now know, instead of firing executives, when our business model doesn't match what's going on outside in the real world, we fire the model. And we simply say, hey, our hypotheses were wrong. So because we've been building the product iteratively and incrementally and keeping our burn rate incredibly low, a pivot is a substantive change to one or more of the business model components. It just simply says, hey, this isn't our customer segment. Our customer segment is really here. Or wait a minute, our revenue model shouldn't be freemium. We should be charging for it from day one. Or wait a minute, we've been using the wrong distribution channel. We need a direct sales force. Or gee, we have the wrong partners. By the way, an iteration is a minor change to one or more of the business model components. So for example, an iteration would be going from charging from you know, $9.99 to you know, $6.99. A pivot would be a change of, gee, our pricing is going from freemium to subscription. That's a substantive change. So the key idea here is a pivot allows you to get out and make changes. Remember, typically only the founders could do pivots, but is actually the heart of what makes customer development radically different than what's come before. The other thing to notice about pivots is that you want to keep them up at a constant speed and a constant tempo. And you want your entire company operating with speed and tempo and decision making just like a metronome. Right? It's constant, it's consistent, and it's relentless. Let's take a look at the first step in customer discovery. You're going to be living this for the next couple of weeks if you're doing this for real. Phase one is you state your hypotheses and you draw the business model canvas. And again, you put the canvas on the wall, you and your team get around and uh, put up yellow stickies. But the next step is you get out of the building. You're going to test the problem. You're going to test your understanding of the customer's problem or need, and you're going to figure out how to build the prototype. The next thing is you're going to test the solution. You're going to test the solution if you're on the web by building a uh, low fidelity and then a high fidelity prototype. And you're going to, again, test your understanding of the customer's needs and whether your solution matches it. And this match, again, is called product market fit. That's the holy grail for entrepreneurs. Am I building something that people can't get enough of or are just willing to open up their wallets and empty it in front of you to get their hands on? And the fourth phase in customer discovery is you verify or pivot. Do people agree that you're solving a high-value problem or need? And do you understand your business model enough to start test selling, which is the next step in customer validation? Now, what's really depressing to most entrepreneurs is the answer most often the first time you go through this is, heck no. You know, it's, and, and what's worse is, well, they kind of sort of like, well, kind of sort of is not a startup. Kind of sort of is people have been nice to you. The only time you know that you have something that's worth investing your time and money in is if people are literally trying to force their money on you or can't use your product even in its buggy, uninitialized form enough. This is what you're looking for. And if you haven't found it yet, that's why the customer development process is an iterative circle. It assumes you will be going through this multiple times. And when you finally, finally, 
think you do have something that matches customer needs, you get to the next step, which is customer validation. Let's take a look at customer discovery one more time in just a different way. Again, if you're using the startup owner's manual, you'll notice these two tracks. And remember I said you have one track for physical, one track for web mobile. And all that is are the different tactics for one channel versus another. But the strategy is the same. State your hypothesis, test the problem, test the solution, pivot and proceed. And remember, all of this is going on outside the building in front of customers. So earlier we looked at the four phases of the entire customer development process, but now let's take a look at the customer discovery process itself and order its phases. And so the phases of customer discovery start with stating your hypotheses, testing the problem, testing the solution, or verifying or pivoting. Let's take a look at the next step in searching for a business model, and that's customer validation. By now, to get to this step, we assumed you believe you have product market fit. Now, you would say, okay, now I could hire people, now I could like run my million dollar Google AdWords campaign, and we say, no, not really. We don't really think you have enough evidence to do so. We kind of hear you that you believe you do. So we're going to do this again, but this time trying to get orders or users or both, depending on what your business model set. So phase one is you're going to get ready to sell. If it's a physical product, you're going to develop sales collateral, meaning the data sheets and price lists and demos, etc. If it's a, um, a web and mobile product, you're going to try to acquire and activate customers, and you're going to build a high-fidelity, minimum viable product, which is a fancy word for your website or mobile app will look like it's almost done. Maybe the help files aren't there, etc., and maybe not all the features, but the core features that people will use. And then you get out of the building, physically or virtually, and you try to get out and sell. And See if you get users or payers or both. The other thing you'll be doing simultaneously with this is develop positioning, which is a fancy word for saying, okay, I now have a lot of customer feedback. How could have I best describe this based on what the customers are actually telling me? Because you'll ask. So I explained it to you like this. How could I have said it better? And, and if you actually listen to them, they actually would have said, yeah, you know, I ignored the first seven things you said, but when you said number eight, that's when I really got interested and excited. And so you're going to develop a both corporate or company and product positioning, and you're going to do this way before you ever spend money on external PR agencies by actually listening to your own customers. And then in phase four, you're going to verify or repeat. And you're going to see if you're ready to start scaling sales and marketing spending in customer creation, which is the most expensive part of a startup. This customer validation stage actually gets you out and you pretend you have the world's largest sales force and you're ready to go, okay, I think it's really going to work because I've tested it in customer discovery. And most of the time you find out, oops, I really didn't quite understand what those customers were saying. And instead of being out of business because you spent all your money on Salesforce or Google AdWords campaigns or customer acquisition, you now have the cash and time to simply go back from phase four and go back and pivot and say, I clearly didn't understand something about my customer segment or features or customer needs or how to uh, do customer relationships, etc. And so customer validation in its detail, again, has two tracks, one for physical, uh, one for web mobile, get ready to sell, sell to early customers who we call early evangelists, develop positioning, and again, either pivot or proceed. So one of the things we keep asking our startups to think about is, how big is this opportunity? That's just a fancy word for saying is, when you're all done and you're spending the next couple of years on the startup, are you going to make like a million or are you going to make a billion? That is, how potentially large is the opportunity? And so what we really want to do is do what we call a market and opportunity analysis. What you've already put together is a business model canvas with your hypothesis that says, look, we're really passionate about this product or service, and we think there's a set of customers out there, and we've put together our revenue model, our first hypothesis, and saying we're going to make a lot of money, and that's great. But there's really kind of a method to this madness, and there's not only one way to do this, but this is the way we kind of think of it. You want to identify who your customers and markets are, and you have, but you now want to size the market look at competitors and figure out whether this market could grow. The first word uh, we want to think about is something called total available market. 
And I like to think of total available market as a pie. It's the entire pie. Total available market says, look, how many people or companies or whatever your unit of sale is would want or need this product and how large is the market in dollars or units if they all bought? That's just a pretty nice uh, calculation. And the question is, okay, uh, how would I find out? In uh, different industries, there are analysts that specialize in vertical markets and enterprise software. It's Gartner and Forrester. In uh, video games, it's the MPD Group. In um, consumer research, it's Nielsen. Uh, if you want to understand how many uh, webs and mobile startups are, you go to the Startup Genome Project, etc. So you need to ask some questions. Is which industry analysts kind of follow your specific domain? And then also Wall Street analysts follow competitors in this business. and uh, That is, they follow who's ever public. And in fact, some of them write very nice research reports. If you have access to a university library or a friendly broker, you could great, uh, get a great free industry uh, analyst report. And I would be asking others as well, and Google is your best friend here. I truly would be spending time trying to understand, is this a billion dollar market? And by the way, if you throw out those numbers, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, well, that's nice, but break it down for me. You know, help me understand how many users, who are the players, what are the competitors, etc. You need to understand this total available market pie in some detail before I'll let you get to the next step. And the next step is, how big is my slice? And we tend to use a fancy word for that is, what's the served available market? And the served available market means, okay, well, instead of the theory that there are 7 billion people in the world, how many people really can use a you know, mobile app? Oh, well, a mobile app is kind of dependent on how many people have mobile smartphones. And gee, if I'm making the mobile app for, let's say, an Android platform, then the first question is, how many theoretical people are going to be using you know, Android platforms in this year and the next five? Oh, now I could start estimating what's my served available market. And so how many people have the money to buy the product? That is, are you a 99 cent product or are you a $99 product? Now you're narrowing the market based on pricing or availability. And you want to do some thought experiments, like how large would the market be in dollars if they all bought? If everybody in the served available market bought, how, how large would this be? And this is kind of your first test to say, oh, or wow. And so you want to understand this both for dollars and units. And how do you find out? Well, this is one where you're really out of the building and talking to customers. And then I think of this again, using the pie analogy, the first step was trying to understand the number of people in the world, but now we can narrow it down if I have an Android app to the number of Android phones, uh, capable phones, and then down to, well, how many would buy at my price? But now we really want to get pretty specific. Who exactly am I going to sell in years one, two, and three? How many customers is that? How large is the market if they all bought? That is, what we now are coming up with is the total number of dollars. If you had 100% market share, your revenue isn't going to exceed this number. And how many units would that be? Again, how do I find out? Boy, this is really about getting out of the building and talking to customers and talking to potential channel partners and talking to competitors, etc. You really, at the end of this exercise, now have a first pass hypothesis about is this business model canvas? worth executing for the next couple of years.